From one islander to another, Isle of Wight Radio proudly presents John Hannam Meets. Welcome to another John Hannah Meets, and I'm so thrilled today to be at the Duke of York's Theatre in London with one of my favourite actors, Roger Allen. Delighted to meet you. And you, John. We're going to talk about The Moderate Soprano in a few minutes, which uh, I've just seen. Very an emotional show. Loved it. Moments of high drama and then really sad moments at times. Yes. Yes. And some comedy, I know. Yeah, hope. very yes. much so. Well, you're a comic almost <clears throat> when you, you did it almost like a stand-up routine when you came on at the start, didn't you? you know. Yes, yes, yeah. Of course, recently Endeavour's been a fantastic series. You've done, I think you've done five, Roger, haven't you? We have, yeah. We're yeah. going to start doing the sixth after I finish this play. Really? Yeah. Because a lot of people were worried there wasn't going to be another one, and but there obviously is. Yes, yeah. Whenever I watch it, I think it's probably the best thing of that particular time on television because they've got it just right, really. I, I think it's, it's the periods there and, uh, and they've got the young guy and they've got yeah, you as yeah. the sort of person well, they, to Well, you know, on. the art department and the designer spend a lot of time kind of getting it to look right and, uh, and stuff like that. And, and Russell, uh, who writes it, has got a fantastic ear for dialogue, I think. Wonderful ear. Do you know what? You've done awfully well for a Sainsbury sh- shelf filler, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> that was a long time ago, wasn't it? That was, yes. Yeah. I uh, I didn't do that for long, you know. No, I know. That was, that was in the days when you could get holiday jobs, you know. Yes. To earn a bit of money. I know early on you sort of had aspirations to become what we would call a real singer, an opera singer, didn't you? Well, yes, it was something I could always do. Uh, my father was a vicar and I sang in the choir and then I went to a, a school that was very musical called Christ Hospital in uh, Sussex. Can I ask you, because mm. I had a, a neighbour on the Isle of Wight who went to that school oh, yeah. and I can vividly remember some sort of uniform. That's costume. right. It was, it's, a, it's a Tudor uniform, <sighs> a long, dark blue coat, a blue coat school. Uh, it was with knee breeches and yellow socks That's and it. silver buttons and a leather girdle and clerical bands. And it was a, a charity school and, and remains a charity school, actually, largely. Uh, when I went there, if your parents earned over a certain amount, quite an average amount, you couldn't go. Uh, and if they earned under a certain amount, you didn't pay anything at all. And between those two points, your parents paid a kind of small contribution, you know, on a sliding scale towards the cost uh, of you being there and they had a a huge uh, huge kind of um, charitable foundation when it I, was a mixed bag i would yes. say for me personally but um i can remember it, it, seeing him in his uniform you that's know. right yeah yeah absolutely what coming back from the school yes, yes that's right yeah <laughs> but it did have and still does a fantastic musical tradition there was a big choir of about 60 i think a small magical choir Lots and lots of facilities for learning instruments, a military band, two huge church organs. In terms of availability of music, it was um, it was very very good. And uh, I sang in the choir as a treble, and uh, you know I I did the the solos and stuff like that. And then when my voice broke, it sort of it settled down relatively and I started having singing lessons I guess when I was about 17 with someone there who then got me singing lessons. I went to university in Manchester and read drama and I think my old singing teacher at school got me lessons with the man who was the vocal consultant at English National Opera, John Hargreaves and he'd he'd um, he'd been a baritone at Sadler's Wells Opera in the 40s and 50s, I think, and he charged me two pounds an hour, um, you know, in the early to mid 70s, which was nothing really. And he was very generous and very encouraging. And while I was at university reading drama, singing was the most natural thing for me to do, I suppose. It's something I'd always done. So I did sort of toy with the idea of going into opera. And there was a, the Royal Northern College had a, uh, an opera postgraduate course. But I I guess, in the end, really, if you want to be a singer, you have to be really completely dedicated to making that beautiful 
classical sound. And also, when you start, you don't know really how your voice is going to settle down and what it's going to be like, you know. So I became less interested in that and more interested in acting, really. I know you saw Pavarotti quite close up, didn't you? Well, re- reasonably close up. When Colin Davis, who went to my school, actually, not when he? I was there, I hasten to add, but uh, he was uh, conductor of the BBC Symphony Orchestra, and then he went to Covent Garden. And so he tried to do a thing of doing promenade concerts there. Or They ripped out all the expensive seats in the stalls, and you could sit on the floor. I can't remember how much for, but it wasn't much. And so... I saw Pavarotti, I can't remember who else, I guess in about 1975 or 6 or something like that, sitting on the floor, and it was, I mean, just remarkable, and it makes you think, well, if I knew I could have sung like that, then, you know, (laughs) maybe I'd have gone for it. But he, you know, to be in the same room as uh, Pavarotti when he was, when he was in his sort of young maturity then, with the flexibility of youth and the, the weight of maturity, and when he hit a high C, it literally would take your breath away. I mean, it was quite extraordinary. He sort of got more people interested in opera, didn't he, because of his fantastic voice and that world A cup wonderful theme. personality as well, yes. I think, really, yes. He kind of popularised it by, you know, the three tenors and the, 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 the solo at the World Cup and things like that, yes, yes. You saw a book in a library, didn't you? You read a sort of a book which, in a way, kind of... L- lent you towards acting was that that's true at school at Christ Hospital in the library I think it was called the Dominions Library but I could be wrong there was a book called Great Acting I think it was by Humphrey Burton I could be wrong there and it was based on a series of interviews done on the on the telly with you know the great generation Gilgood Olivier Richardson you know Michael Redgrave and Peggy Ashcroft, Edith Evans, Sybil Thorndike. And I devoured this book. I think also at school, there were not only school productions, there were also house productions. And the first Pinter play I saw was probably when I was about 13 or 14, was a house production of uh, The Birthday Party. Wow. Uh, and it completely gripped me. I didn't have any problem understanding this place uh, that had you know, an atmosphere of potential violence and rules that didn't seem to make any sense whatsoever. It seemed to me entirely fitting in, a, in an English public school, <laughs> you know. Um, so it, it, it did kind of wake me up to that. And as well, of course, in the holidays, you know, there was a, it was a very good time for drama on the BBC, I think, really. You know. Used to go to the old Vic... Was it about 15p or was it? It was, it was 15 pence. <laughs> but you see, the book that I read, Great Acting, that sort of got me knowledgeable about all that great generation's careers and the name of the Old Vic came up then. And then I discovered that my mother had been to the Old Vic in about 1929 or something to see Gilgood's first season or second season. And um, when I became you know, more interested in the theatre. I think it was when I was about 16 and I was studying Hamlet, I think. And a friend of my sister who lived near the Old Vic said, you should go and see Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead at the Old Vic. And uh, I said, well, how do you do that? Because I had no idea how you got a ticket. And she said, oh, it's all right. You know, know, it's not... You can go and queue on the day and they have day seats for 15 pence in the gallery. (laughs) You could stand for 10 pence. 15 pence was the price of my... Tube fare, you know, in 1970. Yeah. It was the price of my Savoy and chips walking <laughs> across Hungerford Bridge on the way. <laughs> you know, so, and it was the price of the programme. So it was incredibly cheap. And so it opened up this, you know, I went and I saw the play and because I was studying Hamlet, I understood it and it was, it was very funny and brilliantly and skillfully done. And I was, I was deeply... You know, that I think it was then, really, and probably I was kidding myself about the singing, but I think it was probably then that I thought, that's where I want to be, really. And you were quite fond of Paul Schofield as an oh, actor, I weren't you? loved Paul Schofield, yes. So in, in that time, he joined the National Theatre and he did a, a rather wonderful play by Karl Zuckmeier called The Captain of Kerpenick. And uh, he seemed to be able to transform himself physically without going through all this bald cap business that you're looking at now. Yeah. Um, it, 
and he also had this miraculous voice. I mean, I'd be sitting right at the back of the gallery, which admittedly is often quite a good place for sound, but it felt as though his voice, without him raising it or shouting or anything like that, was just right close to you. Miraculous, really. These days, sometimes, if you go to a theatre and you see TV stars that haven't had that sort of training in theatre, they can't always project. And they, But the older people like him, and of course, and Donald Sinton, you could hear them outside, well, that, couldn't you? I think that's to do with experience, really. If you think of that generation, what they'd done mm. in their youth when they started out, was well, they would have done loads and loads and loads of plays in big theatres, you know, in repertory theatres and all over. That was their experience. That's what they got used to. And now that that doesn't exist remotely in the same way. Roger, when you were in Scum, that yeah. was an early play for you. Probably your first one, was it? Professional one? First professional play, yeah. yeah. What was your ambition? Did you have a, a dream at that stage, really? Or I think I wanted to get to the Royal Shakespeare Company or the National Theatre, really. I, think, I didn't really think beyond that. And... Um, the woman directing Scum, Sue Todd, had worked at the uh, the Royal Shakespeare Company and uh, we hired their rehearsal rooms for a week and we did some workshops in there and we did some sonic classes and stuff like that and I I taught some how to do some magicals. So it was all about listening to each other and working with language and stuff like that. So that, I think that was my ambition then. But I felt, because at university, I saw a lot of similar companies to Monstrous Regiment who visited our drama studio. I saw a whole other kind of drama and was and was very engaged with that. You know, I was with them for two and a half years. I was 22 when I started and um, pretty soon we were having meetings with Carol Churchill about the next play. I mean, it was wonderful. I'm a, you know, I did bits of lighting and composed the odd song, played in the band help with the financial books, things like that. So it was hugely involving, I would say. You were the the original Javert, weren't you, in uh, Amazing? Yeah, yeah. That was 85, was it? Yeah. That's right, 85 at the, at the Barbican and 86 in the West End, or just around Christmas, 86. It was very 85. long, Roger, wasn't it? Was it very long when you started? It was, it was. It was longer at the Barbican than it was when it moved to the Palace, yes. It certainly was very long, yes, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> and I um, often say to people, when people get a bad review, you can always say, well, when Les Mis opened in the West End, all the reviews weren't very kind, but... Well, there were some that were very good. They were mixed, you know, but there were a lot that were very suspicious of the Royal Shakespeare Company doing a musical. Um, there were... So it was very... They were Yes, you're right, there were some very half-hearted reviews and some bad reviews as well, but it was always absolutely packed at the Barbican and at the Palace. And Princess Di came to see it at the Barbican, and she loved it, and uh, that was, of course, a lot of publicity uh, at the time. And then she came again to the Palace and brought Charles, and that was a huge amount of uh, publicity again, uh, you know, and I, because I think when we moved into the West End, Cameron Mackintosh was quite nervous about whether it would really run, or you know, or or what. But it just, honestly, there wasn't there wasn't an empty seat in in that fifteen hundred seat theatre for the whole time I was there. I thought that's what the West End was like, you know. <laughs> I'm Vanilla Fielding, and whenever I can, I listen to John Hannah Meets. <laughs> Currently, I'm in the West End, actually, uh, at the Duke of York's Theatre backstage with Roger Allen, who's currently appearing in The Moderate Soprano. In a way, I look on you as a, as a theatre actor who, in a way, has been lucky with TV, because you, you're very much a theatre actor at heart, aren't you? I am. I mean, I guess less so now, but I still try and do a play a year, you know. I try and do that because I like to keep my hand in, I like to keep practising... And uh, I, I guess I wouldn't feel quite like a proper actor unless I could still do a play fairly regularly. But I do hugely enjoy doing film and television work as well. And of course, you know, I'm an oldish father and I've got youngish sons, so uh, I, I need to earn some money, you know. <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Were you in an ITV playhouse quite early on in your career? 
One called it Out of Sight, Out of Mind. Do you Gosh, remember that? yes. That was ATV. It was 1981, Eight. I think, yeah. I don't really remember much about it. It was just before I joined the Royal Shakespeare Company. Was it? It was a one-off play. Was that live then or not? Oh, no, no, no. no. It wasn't live. No. Uh, a lot of it was made in a studio, you know, with multi-cameras, those cameras that looked like Daleks moving yes. around, you know. Moving into the 80s, late 80s, you did lots of sort of TV movies ending up and, and who bombed Birmingham and things like that. You did quite a few of those, didn't you? I did a few of those. That's when it sort of started in the, in the very late 80s. But I, I, I was always attracted back to the theatre. If I was offered a good role, I, I couldn't really turn it down, you know. I didn't really start working more in um, film and telly than uh, than the theatre until oh, in the nineties probably was it? I think later than that, you know, because in the nineties I went to I was at the RSC in the mid nineties again. I did another musical called City of Angels in the earlyish nineties, ninety three. So that was. That was a long time. I was at the National at the end of the 90s. I did art, you know. So I love art. Wonderful I play. loved art as well. I did it twice, actually. I played two different characters. You, did you have the long speech in one or not really? No, I never oh. did that one, no. <laughs> um, but uh, so re- really, actually, the 90s were mainly theatre as well. And it wasn't until after going to the National when Trevor Nunn was there, it wasn't until after that that I finally developed the willpower to turn down the theatre jobs. Then came sort of The Bill and Morse and Midsummer Murders and yeah. Heartbeat and mega series that you went into, really. Yes, but those are just sort of guests, yes. really. You know, you is that nice in. to go in? Yes, it is. Yes, it's it's fine, yeah. 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 But, um, you know, that's, that's sort of bread and butter television, really, for, for you know, do, doing an episode of something, yes. I think, you know. Obviously, when you were in Ashes to Ashes, you were... Um, yes, that was, that was a bit more recurring. You were a copper, you know, weren't yeah, you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then the jury, of course. You were a QC in that, I think, That's right, you? yes. Yeah. And Parade's End was good for you, I guess, was it? Yes, I loved Parade's End, yes. I, I really did, yes. They called that a highbrow down to Navi. Was that a fair well, comment? Well, I think it's a fairish comment. Is it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's a very complex series of novels, four novels, um, condensed into only five hours of television. So you had to be uh, on your toes, I think, uh, to get into it. But it was it was very high quality stuff. I think I loved doing it. There was one particular shot that I had with Benedict Cumberbatch in which they had this huge crane that had to follow us walking round this barracks, and there was a marching band, and there were lots of extras involved, and it was hugely... Con- and they wanted to do this big shot all in one. And uh, I think possibly that's one of my proudest moments on, on film, because we, we did it in one, and I, I was talking all the time. Really? And so, you know, and it, we, we never, you know... So, I mean, it was three takes, and it was three good takes... I was pretty pleased with I'll that. I bet you were. Yeah. <laughs> you were in Game of Thrones as well, weren't you? I was, really briefly. Yes. I'd just been working at the Globe, uh, playing Falstaff. So, naturally, after a long time doing that, I, my, my bank balance had taken a big, big hit. And so I just got offered this thing, which I never, ever heard of. It was the first episode, and a couple of appearances in another two episodes, I think, in uh, in the first episode of the first series of Game of Thrones, so nobody knew what it was. No. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what I was talking about most <laughs> of the time. But it was fun because I I was filming in um, Malta, so it was nice to go out there. I'd never been to Malta. Do you know what? I've never seen it in Game of Thrones. Oh. Never. It is very impressive. You know, if you can get over the the swords and the and the dragons and yes. stuff like that. You know, it, it is actually very impressive. He's got very high production values and very high standards of acting. I certainly saw the thick of it. Ah, yeah. yeah. Were you into politics at all? Are oh, you yes, into, yes, yes, yes. So Very much so, yeah. Did so, you have to be careful, because it was a bit of a satire on politics in a way, wasn't it? Sort careful? Of. No, I'd no. say the opposite of careful, <laughs> <laughs> because they could always cut it out. So that was yes. a one. I loved being involved in that because... Um, it, it was a very different way of making film and television than I'd ever done before or since, I have to say, you know. There was a certain amount of improvisation and there was a certain amount of rehearsal. That's another thing. You hardly ever get any rehearsal in film or television. 
uh, until before the just before you're setting up the shot, really. Peter Mannion, I think you That's were right, in that, yeah, weren't you? Yeah. So fond memories. Oh yes, you? hugely. You've done quite a lot of big movies too, haven't you? Because you did the Pirates of the Caribbean, didn't you? Yes, that was again only you know not not a great part. That was again, I think, kind of. Um, boosting my income after playing full star <laughs> looks good on the cd <laughs> <laughs> but that was you know it was interesting certainly in the mid noughties i did a film called v for vendetta filming in berlin which the wachowskis were um writing and they were directing the second unit it was actually directed by a man called james mctague and um and the wachowskis really really liked what I did and so they did a, a film a couple of years later called Speed Racer in which I was the main villain and I thought oh brilliant this is it this is my entree into into Hollywood uh, into Alan Rickman land I thought, oh uh, lovely I yeah that. but alas the film did very very badly <laughs> so in the end it wasn't but I had a fantastic time doing it I have to say we filmed again in Berlin and it had you know, wonderful American actors, John Goodman, Susan Sarandon, Emil Hirsch, Christina Ritchie. Fantastic cast. It was great. I didn't know what the book Thief was about, but I watched the movie and I enjoyed it. You Were, were you death in that? Or I was, yes. yes. I was deaf. That was a very strange job because I'd never read it either. <laughs> <laughs> I'd never read the book. And, you know, my job was a day in a voiceover studio, being death and just finding the right tone of voice that the director wanted. Mm. Iron Lady. Yes, Iron Lady, yes. That was a big movie, wasn't it, really? Yeah, yes, yes, it was. I mean, not not big like an American movie, but uh, that was just glorious to, to be with Meryl Streep, really. Isn't she amazing? Absolutely fantastic, and also a real proper actor. I mean... Was she you, nice to work with? Lovely to work with, absolutely lovely to work with, and fun, um, no mystique, and would do all her reverses, do you know what I mean? Yes. By, you know, she'd yes. do all those, which, you know, one, I've, actually, I've never worked with anyone who hasn't done their reverses, but one does hear stories of people who just won't act with you mm. when the camera is on you, mm. and you're... Uh, so she did all that. At one point, she was lying on the floor with the camera really low, so she, you know, could do the scene with me. Wow. Lovely woman. And a wonderful actor, of course. Oh, yeah. yes. I think... Every film she's been in, she's, you know, been marvellous. Yeah. Lady in the Van, that was another one, wasn't it, you? Yes, again. A, a, Lovely again, story, that. A, a wonderful story. A really fun character. A chance to work with Nick Heitner, who I'd only done one play with, you know, uh, many years ago at the RSC. And also Maggie Smith, you know. Yes. Fabulous. Sort of Downton in a way. She's always been good, but Downton put her into a... A higher level than ever, don't you I think? I suppose so, I don't know. But she, she has won Oscars, John. Let's I know. Not, let's not forget. But, <laughs> but, it, it but seemed... I suppose it, you know, I suppose the thing is, is that it, it moved her into people's living mm. rooms, mm. you know, and Downton was hugely, hugely popular, and she was hugely, hugely popular in it. So, uh, yes, I, maybe you're right, yeah. The Missing, now that was a another huge series it was so nice to see you in a completely different role in yes that. yes did you feel that was good for your career because it was very much so i i think the reason i like uh, acting i've always been attracted to the variety in it and playing different roles i think you know going back to that book great acting there was pictures of all those great actors in different makeups and stuff like that from their early careers i've always been attracted to that i've always been attracted to contrast so you play one type of character and then the next thing you play you want to be totally different so doing five six series of endeavor can can make me a little bit nervous that I'm going to get sort of backed into a corner, if you if you know what I mean. So, uh, yes, the opportunity to, to do something very different always appeals to me. So, DCI Fred Thursday, yeah. then. <laughs> amazingly popular series, quite rightly so as well. Can I ask you, because there's always... You always seem to... It's never disclosed, but your sort of family, your daughter and your wife, doesn't always seem to be in harmony. Is that... Well, I think it's really. it, yes. I th I think it's, it's got a long form storytelling shape, you know, to right. it, in that it started off when it really was uh, a happy, warm family, and the contrast was with Morse, the outsider, 
you know, who didn't have that in his life. And now, of course, as uh, Joan has uh, has grown up and there's been arguments and tension between her and Fred and uh, and Sam has gone off to the army and, uh, and then his brother uh, in the last series, Fred's brother, uh, dropped him right in it by you me. Know, taking all his money and that's made Wynne leave. So we don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. Oh, you but, don't? But no, no, not yet. But, you know, I think you do feel... But that's been a long time. There's plenty of fun and warmth in the family as well. It's not, not been all... Your retirement's been talked about on and off for a little yeah, while, yeah. hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Roger, when you look back, you've had Jeff as we said, Brutus, Jack Worthing, Macbeth, Hitler, Falstaff, Dr Jekyll, Prospero, just to name but a few. That must have exceeded your wildest dreams because there's such a, a wide variety of characters you've played, really. I don't know whether it exceeded my wildest dreams, really. It's just, it's just what I've always wanted to do, and so playing very different things, again, going back to that book and seeing those great actors of the past playing loads of different things, I thought, oh, that's what I want to do too. And I've been lucky in that, it, you know, quite a lot of that has happened. <laughs> <laughs> Roger, I think you've won a few uh, Olivier Awards, haven't you? I have, yes, yes. I, I've been lucky there, yes. That's always nice. It's not the be-all and end-all of things, but it is it is very nice, yeah. It must be good for a career if you're a nominated or if you win an award. I suppose so. I think it's good within the profession. It's not like, I think, winning an Oscar. If you win an Oscar, then, you know, suddenly lots of film companies are after you. Uh, and your price goes up. It, that doesn't happen with Olivier Awards. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so just before we finish, we want to talk about what you're currently doing, but sort of future-wise, have you got any dreams, any ambitions, or are you happy just to keep working? I'd just keep on, keep at it, and see what comes up and hope that it still does come up. <laughs> Can I just ask you about your family? I know you've got two... Your, your wife's an actress or an actor. Yes, and a writer, yeah. Does she still work? Yes, yes, she does, yes, yes. Do you ever work together? We had a brief scene in Endeavour. She guested in Endeavour in the last she? series, yes. She played a rather racist hairdresser. Oh, uh, right. That's the only time we've worked together. Wow. And are your sons interested in the theatre? Oh, yes, I think they probably are, yes. Well, in some way in, in, in that direction, certainly. Right. right, let's come right up to date then, uh, The Moderate Soprano. I have been to Glyndebourne to have a look around, and it's it's um, a fantastic place. But Beautiful. Your take on it, because it, it's got everything, this play, I think. Yes, I mean, I was attracted to it, first of all, at the very top of the first page when we did it originally in Hampstead. But when I read the play, it said, John Christie comes on, he's short, fat, bald and wearing lederhosen and so instantly in one way I thought ah <laughs> I've never done that before <laughs> but uh, what drew me really into it was that I knew nothing about the story of the founding of Glyndebourne I just thought Glyndebourne was a, a place that you know was hugely hugely expensive and I'd been taken a couple of times that I would never be able to afford to go to um, but one, he's the most extraordinary man, and uh, John Christie, and reading about him and uh, and getting to know what he did, I, I genuinely came to love the man, I have to say, for his eccentricity, his extraordinary will, and also his great generosity, both practically and generosity of spirit. You know, through music and through opera, he found this extraordinary love for this wonderful woman, Audrey Mildmay. So there's that side of the story. And the other side is that they completely lucked out. Because of the Nazi regime in Germany and the and the three people escaping, Fritz Busch, Karl Ebert, who was Max Reinhardt's assistant, Fritz Busch, who was a great conductor, a very uh, hugely famous conductor already then, and Rudolf Bing, who became, you know, one of the great arts administrators in the world, they actually, at that stage, because those three people were escaping Nazi Germany, got the three best possible people in the world, really, to, to run their opera house. 
very so it, uh, I knew nothing about that, and I think that's what gives the story its kind of multifaceted appeal. Really. I've learned such a lot this afternoon yeah. that I didn't know about. It. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's uncanny sat here with you with no hair, <laughs> and I was just thinking <laughs> there there is another person by the name of John Christie who <laughs> indeed, yeah, I could have and a go it's, at with that. some glasses, <laughs> you, you'd be perfect for that. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. I've done. You know me with my hair, not not wishing to brag about it, but you know I do have hair, and I <laughs> I like to use it in my work. This year I'm doing *Moderate Soprano*, putting on the bald cap, which takes an hour and a half. Last year I played Roy Jenkins in a play uh, called *Limehouse* at the Donbar, putting on a bald cap, which took an hour and a half and half an hour to take off. And the year before that was *Moderate Soprano*. Uh, Hampstead. So th the last three things I've done in the theatre, I'm bald. I'll never be able to do it again. <laughs> People are just think, oh, there he is, bald again. Can I just <laughs> ask you how long an endeavour, one episode of endeavour, roughly how long does that take you to film, Roger? It's 23 days of actual filming spread over a, a kind of five-week block, slightly less than five weeks, actually four and a half weeks. Yeah, 23 days of filming. Can I thank you very much? Would you like to tell our listeners why I'm here? Because I had a, a rather surprise email from you because I did write to you some while ago, didn't you I? You did. How long ago did you write to me? Probably about a year. Yes, that's, that's <laughs> the terrible thing because if you saw my desk, uh, you'd think that someone had thrown a bomb at it, really. It's just a horrible, horrible mess and it occasionally briefly gets into less of a mess. And so in a brief period of time... Uh, when it got into less of a mess, I found your letter, and it was about a year old, at least a year old, I think. And so I felt guilty that I hadn't replied, and so emailed you, and that's why you're here interviewing me now. Thank you for your time, and thank you for being so nice. Okay. And I wish your career continued success. Thank you. And you're here at the Duke of York's until June the 30th. That's right, yeah. Thank you so much. Pleasure, John. It's great, he's got a swell personality He meets and greets the stars with such amenity Good enough to make you coming out of the street John Hanna That's right Grateful thanks to Roger Allen. After the show, Roger and I had a lovely cup of tea together and he seemed to remember coming to the Isle of Wight in the 80s to appear for the Royal Shakespeare Company. And I went back on my files and found that he actually appeared on the Isle of Wight in January 1984 in A Midsummer Night's Dream, also in the cast... Wait for this, Daniel Day-Lewis, Polly James, Amanda Root, Robert Edison and Roger Allen, directed by Sheila Hancock, who just happened to be born on the Isle of Wight. Keep looking on the Isle of Wight radio website, the John Hannam website and YouTube for more John Hannam Meets new interviews. Bye-bye for now. Isle of Wight Radio.